Welcome to CFA Institute's podcast, Sustainability Story, where we focus on sustainability topics of interest to investors and others who like to understand how investors think about sustainability. I'm Sandy Peters. I'm a senior head in CFA Institute's Research, Advocacy, and Standards Division. I will be your host today. My group's work focuses on the information, including sustainability information, investors need for investment decision making. Today's podcast focuses on sustainability information investors in the U.S. and other non-EU companies might not know will be coming their way as a result of EU reporting requirements and the extraterritorial nature of their applicability. Let me introduce my guest today. Brian Tomlinson is a managing director in e ys financial accounting and advisory services practice where he focuses on assisting companies with ESG or sustainability disclosures broadly, as well as climate change services more specifically. Welcome, Brian. Thank you for joining our Sustainability Story podcast today. Sandy, great to be with you, and thanks for having me. Recently, I came across one of your LinkedIn posts that referenced an EY technical brief entitled How the EU's Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive Affects non-EU-based multinationals. That's kind of a mouthful. Listeners can Google it and get the full brief for even more detail than we're going to cover today. But the brief reminded me that while the extraterritorial nature of the EU's reporting requirements may be known amongst us policy geeks, they are likely less widely understood by, for example, U.S. companies and even less well-known but likely very interesting to investors in U.S. companies. I thought it would be great for you to share your understanding of the topic and help me help investors understand what this means to them. Interestingly, after we set this conversation up, I presented at the FT's Moral Money America Summit a few weeks ago, and SEC Commissioner Peirce spoke and highlighted the topic we're going to talk about today. She noted the fact that many U.S. companies don't realize these EU standards may be applicable to them. I thought that's true, but even fewer investors understand the applicability of these standards to companies that it, that invest in um, that that companies investors invest in outside the EU. It pleased me to know we were going to have this conversation to help make the topic clearer. Let me provide a little more specific background on the regulations we're talking about before we dive into the conversation. And I know you, Brian, may even talk about more acronyms, but let me do a couple of them um, just in advance. So the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, the ESERS, as they are co more commonly referred to, are the disclosure standards that European companies will be required to follow and provide disclosures in compliance with beginning for the largest companies in 2024 as mandated by the European Corporate Reporting and Sustainability Directive, or the CSRD. So we have the ESERS, which are the standards, and the CSRD, which is the directive, not regulation, but directive that creates them. While many investors know the European companies will be required to make these disclosures, the applicability of them outside the US, as I said, less well known and the subject of our conversation today. So let me start with a couple of questions. We're going to kind of break this down into hopefully some partitions and categories that help make them a little bit more understandable. And I'd like to start with scope. So who is this applicable to? I was hoping that you could start off with how companies outside the EU could potentially get scoped into these disclosure requirements. Yeah, very happy to describe that. And the scoping mechanism under the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, is relatively complex, but it's worth placing it in kind of context of the existing sustainability reporting that the EU has under the non-financial reporting directives. The EU's had sustainability reporting for more than, um, for around about 10 years or so. Um, existing uh, reporters under the non-financial reporting um, directive have tended to be large listed EU incorporated entities that have over 500 employees. So around about 10,000 companies have been scoped into the non-financial um, reporting directive. The CSRD replaces the non-financial reporting directive and really expands the number of companies that are scoped into sustainability reporting against a much wider set of standards by around about five times. So that 10,000 
figure becomes over 50,000. And it achieves that expanded scope of entities through a number of different means. First of all, it scopes in all entities that have transferable securities listed on EU regulated market, excluding the very smallest companies that are referred to in the, in the regular, in the directive as micro undertakings. It also scopes in entities on the basis of size, basically on the basis of being large. That's all EU entities, irrespective of the jurisdiction of incorporation of their ultimate parent. Now it's scoping those entities in on to the extent that they exceed a uh, size thresholds, basically on based on balance sheet, turnover, and the number of employees. Now it's scoping those in on a standalone basis, but also on a consolidated basis. So this can have the effect of scoping in the entities that an EU uh, entity holds, even though those non-EU, even though the entities that it holds are non-EU based. So that kind of scopes in a significant number of EU incorporated entities, again, irrespective of who their ultimate parents are. But it also, there's also an additional scoping mechanism that picks up third country groups that do a substantial amount of economic activity in the EU. And that can scope in uh, re reporting against the CSRD at the level of the third country parent. So as you can see, you have a huge expansion to the number of entities that are going to be scoped into reporting against European sustainability reporting standards. Now, why is the EU doing this? So partly it's doing this as a response to the overlying objectives of the EU Green Deal. So firstly, the achievement of, and that sets out a range of pro-sustainability, economy-wide public policy goals, such as net zero by 2050, 55% reduction of carbon emissions by 2030. And the EU is really kind of placing sustainability as a core element of its growth strategy. And additionally, they're intentionally trying to have extraterritorial effects. So they're scoping in potentially non-EU entities. They're also looking at kind of the value chain of entities that operate in the EU. So again, they're looking beyond the fence line of the reporter themselves. So it really is kind of the Brussels effect kind of on steroids. And additionally, they're looking at entities that have tapped EU liquidity. Basically, if you are listed on an EU regulated market, applying sustainability disclosures to those entities too. So it's a significant expansion um, of the number of entities that are going to have to report on sustainability. And as we'll talk about later, reporting against a much more extensive set of standards than we've seen in any other jurisdictions. So you can get scoped in by doing business directly, indirectly, maybe even, and by having securities that are transferable in EU markets. Yeah, that's the tentacles, if you will, of the CSRD. Yes, that's right. So entities incorporated in the EU are, can be scoped in on the basis of size. Entities that have transferable securities, debt and equity listed on an EU regulated market can be scoped in. And also those entities that have essentially a sort of non-de minimis footprint in the EU and derive significant revenues from the EU can also be scoped in. So it really does have a kind of extraterritorial effect, but also scopes in a significantly increased number of entities uh, incorporated in Europe as well. So if that wasn't complicated enough, let's talk about reporting options. So exactly how you have to report. So from my reading of the standard as an accountant or as a CPA and as a, as a CFA, it seems really complicated. So there seems like there's a lot of different options that those who get scoped in can actually follow or need to follow. And I was wondering if you could give us a high level summary of that. But uh, Actually, as I read the brief, I found this like one of the most complicated areas, even more complicated than who's scoped in because my, my head sort of started to spin because it seems like it's sort of exponential of who's in. It's who's in and then what do they tell us, right? <laughs> or the, the, what, what their yeah, options the, are and then what they tell yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. So there's a natural flow of work in relation to CSRD where you start with scoping, essentially working out what the size of the problem is. And then that moves into a consider series of considerations around how you're going to report on CSRD. So the scoping is really kind of somewhat mechanical, which is that you're taking those criteria around size and listing and substantial economic activity, and you're applying those to your group structure. But then you're then thinking about 
how those then flow into the available uh, reporting options. So you have a kind of mechanical process that then bleeds into a kind of strategic footprint kind of reporting process. And many companies are kind of doing this on an iterative basis. It's kind of a bit like playing three-dimensional chess, working out how to report on CSRD. Crucial, though, given the time horizons which we'll talk about next, that companies get started. So we kind of summarize that there are broadly kind of three categories in which you might think about how to report on, on CSRD. Firstly, there's thinking about reporting on your EU incorporated entities as they are scoped in to CSRD. So reporting those standalone and consolidated entities essentially individually, reporting them against CSRD. Now, given the number of incorporated entities that many US group companies will have in the EU, this is often going to be a fairly unattractive option because for many large companies that do significant business in the EU, you'll have literally hundreds of entities scoped into CSRD reporting. So the prospect of doing hundreds of individual CSRD reports is highly unattractive. You also then have this concept within CSRD of doing a false consolidation for your EU incorporated entities to allow you to essentially issue one report. To essentially take all those entities that are scoped into CSRD, pick one of your entities that has had the most turnover in the EU over uh, the last five years and do a false consolidation so to enable you to do one report to satisfy your CSRD reporting obligation, at least in relation to those EU entities that are scoped in. But then you have many entities that are thinking about reporting on CSRD at a global level. So using the subsidiary reporting exemption to wrap all of those scoped in entities into a report that you issue uh, at the global uh, level. Now, uh, you also, though, have, in addition, the consideration of reporting, the, the fact that the inclusion of the reporting under CSRD is staggered. So you can have entities scoped in into financial year 24, 25, 26, and then subsequently in 28. So thinking about the interaction effects of that timeline is something that is, uh, again, important in terms of thinking through CSRD scoping. But there are a range of considerations, I think, that uh, companies are thinking through when they think through their reporting options. One is just the extent to which they're scoped in. So for some US headquartered companies that have a substantial footprint in the EU, the way in which the CSRD scoping criteria work can scope in a proportionately very large share of your business into CSRD reporting. So we've seen examples of companies where they may have only 20% of their revenues derived from the EU, but because of their hold co structure, like their elevated EU hold co structure, a majority of their business is scoped into reporting against CSRD. So this is, I think, one of the complicating factors around the way in which CSRD can land in a particular group structure, depending on what your org chart looks like. But then there are, I think, are a range of other considerations around, you know, the comfort with the disclosures that you're going to have to make. Are you going to be able to retain a leadership position in ESG when you're reporting on um, CSRD? Companies that want to retain their basically an enterprise level approach to how they report on ESG issues thinking about how CSRD disclosures interact with the range of other regulations that they're going to be subject to, whether or not that's ISSB, SEC, California. So really a range of strategic issues playing into how you think through the reporting that you're going to have to do in relation to CSRD. So it does get complex and it is an iterative process, but we see many advanced companies are really getting in deep into this uh, these set of considerations now given the proximity of the uh, compliance time horizons. Yeah, so it seems like you need to know what you do as business, what legal entities you have, how they consolidate up legally, but then your false consolidation sort of reminds me as a combination. You sort of need to say, well, we don't consolidate them way, this way legally, but we need to look at it this way to see if like, adding them all up rather than consolidating them per se in the traditional use of the term consolidation from an accounting perspective to see what option looks best. And then what I hear you saying is, and then I got to think about how sort of my competitors are reporting so that it's comparable and, and, and understandable. You know, it's it's like a massive multi-factor <laughs> model on how you actually make make this decision. I, I, it's this almost, this yeah. was so hard when I read the brief. You did a really good job of explaining yeah. it, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. It's almost like there's a, a baseline set of kind of compliance considerations, how we scoped in and how would we report on CSRD to reach compliance. But then there's that broader set of capital markets, peer analysis and disclosure considerations, which I think are much more strategic. Mm-hmm. So I think it does make the decision a particularly nuanced one. Yeah, absolutely. So you touched a little bit in your conversation there because they're one of those elements of that multi-factor model was the effective dates from some of the entities that would be scoped in. So you touched on there some key effective dates, but why don't you get, sing me a few more bars of that, if you will, and then what the re- reporting frequency is. Is it just once a year or is this semi-annual or, or how frequently are these going to need to be done? Yeah, so the, the, the compliance time horizon for CSRD is essentially staggered. Um, and, and that's essentially done on the basis of uh, size and sophistication uh, of the filer. So the, the first set of companies that will be scoped into reporting against CSRD are those reporters who are already reporting against the non-financial reporting directive. So that those companies will be scoped into CSRD reporting for financial years beginning 1 January 2024, reporting in 2025. All the other newly scoped in entities reporting against CSRD then follow on from that. So those entities scoped in on the basis of being large, passing that two of three threshold test in relation to balance sheet, turnover, and employees. And that's the part that's going to scope in most of those new entities that are members of you know US groups. Those will be scoped in from 1 January 2025 reporting in 2026 you then have listed small and medium-sized enterprises that will be scoped in from financial years beginning 1 January 2026 uh, reporting in 2027 although there is an additional two-year derogation for those entities then for that additional extraterritorial scoping concept which is third country groups that have a substantial economic activity in the EU the compliance time horizon for those is reporting from for financial years beginning 1 January 2028, reporting in 2029. However, I think it's important to note that how you're scoped in to CSRD affects what you will report on. So for instance, those entities scoped in to, for financial years beginning 2024 and 2025 will report against the full set of European sustainability reporting standards. Listed SMEs will report against a narrower set of standards for uh, listed SMEs, which we haven't seen yet. Those entities scoped in in 2028 will report against a third country specific set of standards that, again, we haven't seen yet. So there are some aspects of CSRD that are incomplete in terms of the due process. And one point to note that we haven't touched on yet, but we ought to reference is just that member state transposition, the basically the movement of the directive from being a commission document into the law of each of the EU member states is ongoing and will be open until July 24 next year. So gives you a sense, I think, of the, the comprehensiveness of the project and the complexity of it. Happily, CSRD disclosures are an annual effort, which will be uh, included in the management report of EU incorporated entities. We'll talk more about disclosure location more specifically later, but it is an annual reporting frequency. Yeah, there's the, a really couple of good points there. I mean, it's really complicated, right? Like, I, I thought one of the really good points you made was that when you get scoped in affects what you have to report, right? So it's going to take a while for these to sort of sync up and be even more comparable. I think that the point you also made about this being a directive versus a regulation is something that people outside of the European Union may not understand. I mean, the policy people understand that it's, you know, a directive. It's not a a law per se in the respective country within the EU. And so the countries also need to act. That's a very important point that those of us in the U.S. in particular don't necessarily always sort of grasp. So I think that's that's a really important point. Just the story gets more complicated as we go. And this is uh, this is the EU's version of um, Schoolhouse Rock, how a, how a bill becomes a law. <laughs> but And just to note on that, it is important for companies to monitor member state transposition in the jurisdictions in which they have scoped in entities. 
because there are ways in which member states can adjust a directive as they trans as they transpose it into national law. Just to highlight two of them, one is in the form of gold plating. Basically, a member state can't subtract from a directive, so they can't make it less onerous, but they can make it more onerous, and they can um, expose more entities to, to, to reporting potentially. So that's worth noting. And then also within CSRD, there are options that member states can choose, such as local language uh, reporting requirements. So important for companies alongside getting familiar with the scoping mechanism, thinking about how they're going to report on it, getting ready for the reporting for the disclosures set out in the sustainability reporting standards to also just note the local jurisdictional implications of having scoped in entities in an EU member state. Yeah, that's really helpful. I've heard the term gold plating before, but I don't think I've completely, maybe I'm maybe I'm more in tune with it now. Well, I'm, I'm more in tune with it how you explained it, but I'm more, the, the applicability of this has really drawn my attention to it. So let's, you've talked about how the disclosures that are required depend upon um, the entities and the effective dates. But if you could tell me a little bit about the nature of these disclosures, and this is super complicated and there's a lot to it, but just broadly speaking, like what does this all include? Yeah, so I often start this by talking, by, by taking the comparative perspective and talking about this in reference to, for instance, the SEC's climate proposal, which obviously we wait with bated breath for that proposal to become a rule. Because obviously many companies noted how extensive and onerous potentially that climate proposal was. But just noting that the European Sustainability Reporting Standards are sort of paradigmatically more extensive than the SEC's climate proposal. So if the climate proposal took a fairly maximalist approach to climate. The ESRS standards take a maximalist approach to ESG generally. You know, we joke that it's kind of everything you wanted to know about ESG, but we're afraid to ask. One of the reasons for that is that when the commission would, were delegating the responsibility to create the standards to um, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAG, they essentially told EFRAG that they had to reference, mirror, incorporate over 10 existing ESG voluntary reporting standards into the ESRS standards and account for how those standards had been incorporated. So those would include things like the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board uh, Disclosures, which have now been incorporated into ISSB, the Global Reporting uh, Initiative, GRI, and a laundry list um, of others. So it kind of explains why these ESRS standards are um, so extensive. The standards are structured in a number of ways. There are kind of cross-cutting standards, which require a range of disclosures around how company is governed in relation to sustainability, how a company's strategy and business model responds to sustainability. But then there are a range of topical standards and in relation to each element of the E, the S, and the G of the ESG spectrum. So in relation to climate, you don't just have a standard in relation to climate change, which would be the ESRS standard, which is closest to the SEC's climate proposal, but you also have an individual standard on pollution, an individual standard on water and marine resources, same with biodiversity and ecosystems and resource use and circular economy. In relation to the S of the ESG spectrum, you have own workforce, workers in the value chain, affected communities, consumers and end users. And in relation to governance, in addition to those core governance disclosures you make about how ESG is overseen, how sustainability issues are overseen, you also have a range of business conduct disclosures in relation to the G of ESG. And each of these standards requires the disclosure of policies, action plans, and targets, and also sets out a range of topic-specific metrics. So they really are very extensive. And we'll talk a, a little bit more about how the way you report on the standards, it responds to your materiality assessment. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I, I know when um, last summer when they were out for consultation, I think I, I think there were 12 of them. Then I added up the pages of just how many pages I needed to read to respond to these. I think it was like 700 or something, right? At the same time that we needed to respond to the SSB's consultations and 
the SEC's climate consultations. It was quite a lot. But, you know, the one thing also that our listeners, I mean, are, who are mostly investors in our organization, CFI Institute, is is focused on is, you know, investors. And there are different kinds of investors. There are investors who are interested in value relevant information only and those that are values relevant or some combination of both, right? And you started off by saying that in discussing these, it's always helpful to do it in a comparative fashion, right? And so when I think about, or what I like to remind people is that when we think about the SEC's climate proposal, that's coming from a regulatory process. And the European rules are coming from a political and legislative process. So they're meant to meet a different set of users' needs. And so I wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit about that and sort of what the implications of that are on who and maybe a little bit on materiality, but maybe we'll save that. But <laughs> first is like, who are we doing this all for? Exactly. Well, we'll definitely get into the double materiality construct under the CSRD because it is so central uh, and such a structural feature of how companies will report on CSRD. But it is worth noting that the EU is taking an expansive approach to the users of the information that ESRS disclosures are intended to reach. So it does take a kind of multi-stakeholder approach. And this reflects the way in which it thinks about materiality, again, that we'll talk about. So for instance, it uses an approach to stakeholders to think through affected stakeholders. Now these sit in a range of um, categories, which could, could include things like employees, affected communities, and so on. So for those companies who are very familiar with, for instance, doing something like the GRI stakeholder consideration process, some of the way in which you think about affected stakeholders, categories of affected stakeholders, will reflect the way in which your existing GRI processes are set up. The EU does also, in its guidance, ask companies to consider categories of stakeholders who may be, in inverted commas, silent stakeholders. So it identifies nature, for example, as a silent stakeholder who you can't necessarily consult as part of a stakeholder engagement process, but you can think through the impacts that you may have in relation to that stakeholder. The standards also then think through the users of the disclosure. Now, they specifically identify users of general purpose financial information. So thinking about the investor audience is going to use this information. But they also reference a broader set of stakeholders in relation to the users of uh, the, these disclosures, uh, which would also include people like civil society groups, governments, and others. So it is a really expansive category of users. The EU is develop these standards to reach. And if you think about it, it's kind of an, a hybrid across, say, GRI stakeholder-focused disclosure and SASB investor-focused disclosure. But actually, the list of uh, stakeholders that the EU is thinking about is arguably more extensive than both, even when combined. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that's a lot. So let's, let's move on to a simpler topic. What's uh, the difference between single materiality or financial materiality and double materiality. But it just in this context, maybe if you could sing me a few bars on single versus double materiality and how companies will actually, how do you know how, do you know how to make a materiality decision based on silent stakeholders or, or, or affected communities? So the, the EU has developed this concept of double materiality and that encompasses two elements. So it encompasses the financial materiality of sustainability issues and also the impact materiality of sustainability issues. Now, these are important to indicate the way in which these are quite different concepts. So the financial materiality is essentially an outside-in concept of materiality. It's asking, how are sustainability issues affecting the performance and prospects of the business itself? Impact materiality is more of an inside-out construct, and it's asking how is the business and its value chain and business relationships, essentially the way it's doing business, impacting the world around it. 
and that could include employees, affected communities, and and so on. Now, under the EU's construct, something is material if it is either impact material or financially material. It doesn't have to be both. Worth noting that these concepts can be rather related. So, for example, something often can begin impact material, such as, say, plastic pollution and other similar issues can have impact on communities long before they rise to the level of financial materiality. So what the EU is saying is you have to consider both. They are related but independent of each other. Critically, the way in which your double materiality assessment is concluded affects the way in which you disclose against those ESRS standards. So to the extent that either on an impact or financially material basis, something rises to the level of materiality and it is a topic under the ESRS standards, you'll have to disclose that topic. Importantly, worth noting that because the disclosures under the ESRS standards are going to be subject to assurance, again, which we'll talk about, both the process and the outcome of double materiality are disclosed. The other thing to know about materiality is that it is a, is a dynamic process. So it's something that's going to have to be refreshed year in, year out, aligned with the annual reporting timeframe. And that as part of the double materiality assessment, the EU is thinking about, is asking companies to think about the forward story. So these disclosures are somewhat forward looking in that you're thinking not just about the impacts and financial materiality today, but you're thinking about how those will change in the future across both sort of short, medium and long term time horizon. Many companies that are reporting against SASB or reporting against GRI will have some of the architecture in place, I think, to help them with these initial approaches to get to an aligned double materiality assessment under these standards but even the most advanced reporters will have work to do. You know, in investors are always interested in forward-looking disclosures, right? And we've advocated for many forward-looking disclosures over time. In fact, I did a paper circa 2014 on forward-looking information to show how much forward-looking information is actually in financial statements already when we were advocating for some more forward-looking measurements in the financial statements, actually. But it's an interesting concept because, you know, the difference in the timing of when something is material from an impact to a financial materiality, for at least our perspective and some of the things that we have CFA Institute have said is that we think the financial effects disclosures are very important or their maturation to becoming financial effects disclosures are very important. And so we've spent some time looking at those within the IFRS standards and in the ESERS to say, are these really going to be able to help us determine when this impacts the entity, right? And I was reading something recently and somebody was talking about how discount rates is what is really hurting the incorporation of sustainability in financial or in financially value relevant because some of these things may happen such a long time from now that they're being discounted. And interest rates going up is only making that worse. <laughs> it was sort of an interesting point. You made some things, you made the point that some things may be disclosed because of the fact that they are financially material and some will be disclosed because they are impact material or they're um, material under the impact assessment. But those disclosures, it won't highlight why the decision was taken to put them in or, or might companies disclose that or might, is it required that they do that to say, under which materiality assessment a, a disclosure is being made or it's just there and you will have to figure it out as an, as an investor? The extent of disclosures in relation to the double materiality assessment, we haven't yet seen that because the double materiality assessment is, is novel. EFRAG has, is in the process of developing implementation guidance to provide filers with more guidance as to how they can conduct the double materiality assessment in a way which is aligned with the details set out in the ESRS standards. But essentially, the process for conducting the double materiality assessment will be subject to disclosure. And the process itself is also subject to assurance We'll just have to see the extent of granularity of those disclosures when they're made for the first time. 
So two more things. <laughs> Of one is the location of the disclosures. Where will these disclosures show up for EU companies, but then non -EU, more interestingly, non-EU companies? The EU incorporated entities, the CSRD disclosures will be included in the management report. If you think about what the EU is doing, they are have amended the accounting directive to include these ESRS sustainability disclosures as part of the same architecture of disclosure as their f uh, as financial uh, disclosures. So essentially the ESRS standards will go in the management report, will be subject to assurance and it places that it places sustainability disclosures on the same footing as financial disclosures. However, as we discussed earlier, we're talking about the reporting options under CSRD. Many US headquartered companies with substantial entities sort of scoped into CSRD in the EU may think about reporting on CSRD at the global level. Now, the EU has provided helpful clarification that to the extent that a third country parent is reporting on CSRD disclosures, those disclosures do not have to go in the management report of that third country parent. So there isn't a requirement under CSRD for, say, a U.S. parent to put the CSRD disclosures in the 10K. The CSRD is clear that those disclosures go in the consolidated sustainability reporting of the third country parent. So for U.S. headquartered groups, the C compliance CSRD reporting can go in a consolidated sustainability report. They don't have to go in the K, though, of course, you may consider a range of potential kind of securities law considerations around making extensive disclosures at the level of your US parent, which is also the level at which you're making your SEC disclosures. Got it. Okay. Ooh. All right. Let's, last topic, verification or assurance over the disclosures. So is this required? We've done numerous surveys over time, CFA Institute. Investors have said they want it assured. The level of assurance is not quite, they're not quite decided on that. We don't need to talk about the level here today, but just, just is it required under the CSRD? So CSRD disclosures are subject to assurance and they're subject to assurance from day one at a limited assurance level. There is a proposal within CSRD that the move from limited to reasonable assurance would be subject to a feasibility analysis which is subject to the uh, EU, I think, overseeing and reviewing those first few years of reporting on, under um, CSRD and the practicalities of the uh, limited assurance level uh, that it's applied. So both the ESRS disclosures themselves and the double materiality assessment, for example, will be subject to assurance from day one. Again, important to understand the local law implications of assurance as well, because there are options within CSRD around who can provide the assurance under CSRD. So important to track CSRD transposition to see if member states make adjustments to who can provide assurance in the jurisdictions where you have scoped in entities. So limited to start based on a feasibility study, maybe going to reasonable, right? Okay. Exactly. All right. You know, one of the things that we at CFI Institute have said as it relates to assurance is that there's been some discussion in Europe about prohibiting the company's auditor from doing this assurance. And that's not something that we want <laughs> because we think that there is an inextricable link between the financial statements and these sustainability disclosures. And as I mentioned before, the financial effects or what will become the financial effects over time are important. And we need an integrated thinking process around that. And having two separate people doing it isn't just an hour experience, isn't the best idea, right? There, but I work with the Public Interest Oversight Board, and it's interesting, you know, there's the IAASB, the International Audit and Assurance Standards Board, has a has a standard out or exposure draft out on who's providing or on a, a standard on how you provide assurance over this information. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of need for specialists and use of other people in the process. But, you know, we've said 
we want a relationship between the, pe the person providing assurance over the financial reporting and the non-financial or sustainability um, information because it, you know, some people call it pre-financial. I'm not sure I like that, but you know, it it ultimately um, we're interested in making sure if there are some financial effects associated with it. So we'll see how that all pans out. I, I really think this has been great. Thank you, Brian, so much for doing this. You know, as I said, I read the brief, but I think you actually really bring it to life and give us a little bit more of the context of the challenge of as to the applicability and the comparability and where the information will be available and what's included and when it will be provided and whether it will be assured. So I think you meet you met my objective today of highlighting to investors in a relatable way that this is something that they should pay attention to and it's important to them and that it's complicated and they need to pay attention and, and ask questions about it, even if they're investing in non-EU companies because because of the extraterritorial nature of it. So thank you for that. As I said at the outset, you can obtain EMY's more detailed brief by Googling how the EU's corporate sustainability reporting directive affects non-EU-based multinationals. <laughs> so thanks again, Brian. Thanks for joining us today. To be with you. Thanks so much, Sandy. Thank you.